constructed sit-in protests consisting of supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi. The breakup of these citizens quickly degenerated to brutal violence, placing the state in chaos. One particular group, who were neither part of the sit-ins nor responsible for their breakup, were targeted in the aftermath, Coptic Christians. Militant protesters set ablaze more than 50 Coptic churches, destroying grand cathedrals centuries old. Within 48 hours, each saw more sectarian violence to occur than in the previous 20 years combined. Good morning. My name is Amanda Sadra, and today I will be presenting on that minority, Coptic Christians, more colloquially known as Copts. My project is titled, entitled The Coptic Question, Analyzing Coptic Christian Political Representation in Present-Day Egypt. I'd like to warn that some of the images in media I'm going to show today are extremely graphic and depict violent images. If you don't wish to see them, I ask that you leave them now and we'll take them. Coptic Christians comprise 10% of the Egyptian population and are believed to have descended from the pharaohs themselves. For millennia, the community has suffered extreme persecution and institutional discrimination at the hands of various forces. They most notably have faced extreme violence in the aftermath of Egypt's two recent revolutions. In my project, I examine Coptic Christian political representation in relation to two different aspects of Egyptian society, the Coptic Orthodox Church and the Egyptian state. Specifically, my research question asks, how have the relationships between Coptic Christians in the church and Coptic Christians in the state changed due to the recent uprisings of January 25, 2011 and June 30, 2013? Methodologically, my research included in-person and Skype interviews, totaling 35 individual interviews and 40 group interviews. They were with church members, NGO representatives, Christian and Muslim revolutionaries. I also engaged in observational participation in Egypt for six weeks, as well as examined archival records housed at the American University in Cairo. To interpret my findings, I rely on historical comparative analysis via process tracing, as well as refer to my conceptual tool of Fiona McCollum's definition of human security theory. Human security theory is a paradigm for understanding global vulnerabilities that argues that the proper reference for security should be the individual rather than the state. Human security holds that a people-centered view of security is necessary for national stability and entails physical protection and equal rights for all citizens before the law. Today, I will present to you the Coptic Christian struggle for human security via political representation. But before I do that, I'll provide you with a brief history of the Muslim Brotherhood's presence in Egypt, which was founded in the country in 1928. The group is currently at the center of Egypt's turmoil. Please note, however, that the current situation, as you might guess, is constantly in flux, forever creating, changing, and destroying. But as of this morning, this is what I have found to be relevant and true. The struggle for Egypt between the Muslim Brotherhood and progressive secularists is deeply rooted in within the country. Beginning, it, beginning with the establishment of the Egyptian state under President Nasser in the 1950s, the Muslim Brotherhood has always had to try to have a hand in Egyptian politics. Nasser, fearing the loss of his own life, outlawed the brother of his own power, outlawed the Brotherhood. His successor, Anwar al-Sadat, legitimized the Muslim Brotherhood in an attempt to garner his own political support. During his reign, the Brotherhood grew stronger, becoming rooted in Egyptian society and gaining influence. At one point, to satisfy the Brotherhood, Sadat imprisoned the outspoken Coptic Pope at the time, replacing him with his own interim. Ironically, the Brotherhood assassinated Sadat after he signed an unpopular peace treaty with Israel. So too, in the aftermath of Dai, was the Pope sitting next to him at the parade. Mubarak, Sadat's VP, took power following him, promptly outlawing the Brotherhood, but tolerating their functioning in Egyptian society. Mubarak's reign would end 30 years after he took power, when en masse, Egyptians grew frustrated with Egypt's direction and called for his resignation in the January 2011 revolution. His resignation would clear the way for Mohamed Morsi, whose election as a member of the Muslim Brotherhood himself would seem to signify the Brotherhood's final victory in Egypt. Alas, his reign was short-lived, coming to power in June of 2012 and ending on July 3, 2013. The Egyptian military, led by pictured on the bottom left General Sisi, forcibly removed Morsi after the June 30, 2013 revolution, when 33 million people protested his rule. Sadly, Egypt remains unstable due to widespread social turmoil. Coptic Christians have served as a scapegoat, believed by some to be responsible for all of Egypt's woes, compromising their human security and defining the relationship of the church and the state as marginalized politically and dependent on the church's public 
of the Olympics. Despite this, two new trends have emerged challenging their pre-revolutionary status. My interviews and analysis reveal that the revolutions have created an opportunity to pave a way for a better form of Coptic human security. I will now demonstrate these trends by comparing their relationships between the Copts and the Church and the Copts and the State to their pre- and post-revolutionary status. The relationship between Copts and the Church has been relatively static since the 1970s. McCollum explains that because the State does not grant basic human security to the Christian community, and there is no form of civilian political representation, representation defaults to the Coptic Pope. As a result, the community reacts to turmoil in the name of Christ by, quote, turning the other cheek, end quote, and always advocating for peace and speedy reconciliation, no matter the situation. The graphic to the right depicts the structure of granting human security pre-revolutions. The state remains at the top with consolidated power, the church as the intermediary, and the people at the lowest point, forcing whatever little human security does exist to rely on the generosity of the state. After the January 2011 revolution, a group of Christian youth known as the Mispero Youth Union were outraged by the state's response to an event known as the Mbaba attacks. In the Mbaba attacks, three churches were burned and several Coptic homes attacked in a series of incidents, leaving 23 dead and 232 wounded, some in their own homes. The state did nothing about it, while the church insisted on forgiveness. On October 9, 2011, the union decided to protest for justice for the attacks outside the Mispero TV station in Upper Egypt. The military invaded their gathering. I warn you that the following clip of the military invading is very graphic and contains disturbing images, as well as those that follow it. This short clip depicts the Army's military drink tanks driving their vehicles into the crowds, crushing bodies in half. Live ammunition is shot aimlessly at all in attendance, killing 30 and wounding hundreds. The military breakup of peaceful protesters would be known as the Maspero Massacre. The following images of pictures of the massacre's victims are also extremely graphic. community, horrified at the military's attack, pleaded to the church for help. The Pope responded by inviting the army generals to a mass, shaking hands with, them at, hands with them at the end to signify that all was forgiven. Thousands of Christians in attendance that day at the mass began to scream and yell at their Pope, Pope Shemuda III, and broke out chanting, quote, down, down, his military rule, end quote. Three months later, five men were arrested for the lives lost during the massacre all of whom were Coptic protesters. Shortly after Maspero, organizations began to form that served the singular purpose of providing political representation for Coptic congregants apart from the church, signifying a fundamental break between Coptic acceptance of the church's political representation and their so-called human security. Many subjects explained to me that they felt Maspero was the breaking point between the politics of the church and the people. Hanny Fareed, head of one such organization entitled The Coptic Voice, explained to me passionately and intently that, quote, the church is not equipped to represent us politically. Because they are the church, they must act with pacifism, which is correct because they are a church. But pacifism will only get you so far. We need to demand our rights. The church cannot and should not do that for us. What's more, clergy members seem to believe that the church has no place in politics and should act purely in the spiritual realm. Bishop Ted 